you mind if we start over? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's good. All right, yeah, the first one was warm up. All right, so this is who I am. I'm the author of the book. It's called The Prophet. It's on corporate strategy, implementation, and execution. I'm very proud to sit on the board of directors for the American Petroleum Institute, API, here in Houston. And uh, maybe, I see there's a lot of people here from Houston, uh, maybe we met in the campaign trail when I ran for Congress. Believe it or not, I didn't win, and that's why I'm here today. <laughs> Oh, I put the football helmet up because uh, this is cool. I got a phone call two days ago, U of M, Michigan. They said, hey, would you be willing to come up here and speak? And I said, I will do it in the fall before a football game. And they said, deal. <laughs> so I'm excited for that. And then I told my dad last night, and he said, oh my god. I said, how cool is that? He said, I didn't know they let C students come back. <laughs> Probably B plus. All right. So here's the roadmap of where we'll go. Um, we're going to talk about just an overview, right? What what is M and A? What what goes on? A lot of we hear about in the papers, we hear about in movies, but really, what is it? Why do people do what they do? Part two, the integration. Then part three, let's really delve into HR issues. And then part four, the best practices. There's a lot of detail on these slides. Uh, I know you have access to the PDF. If you don't have access to it, uh, just send me an email. My card's up front, and I'll email you the presentation. I don't want you to spend all your time taking notes, right? All right, part one, the overview. Again, we finished this. I'll take any questions in this section. So all right, mergers and acquisitions. They're similar, but they're different. So I put mergers in that purplish color and, and acquisitions in the gray color. So mergers are, think of two companies of roughly the equal size. They'll come together to form a new entity. They might take a portion of each name or use one name. There's a lot of reasons why they do it, but the underlying factor is always competitiveness. I've listed a whole bunch of more specific things, you know, control vertical, <laughs> horizontal, channels, you know, all the, all the stuff we talk about in B-School. But it's really at the heart, it's about being competitive. I like to think of a good example, a theoretical one. Pretend there are two dry cleaners on one city street. They're really eating at each other. But then one day they said, hey, what if we merge together and we can share the accounting we can share the HR, we can share some of the marketing budget, we'll have greater economies of scale to make purchases. So let's come together, we'll split it. And then they can rename themselves city cleaners, right? A merger of equals. But the other side, an acquisition. Most often, certainly not always, but most often it's when a larger firm buys a smaller firm. There's a lot of reasons why you might do that. You might want their intellectual property. You might want their, their customer list, their geographic footprint. We'll go into a lot more details coming up, but I wanted to just give you that basic understanding of the difference. For a metaphor here, I'm going to make one up the top of my head about an acquisition. Think of a shark. The shark is out there swimming, and he sees a little fish, and he bites that little fish. And so the shark acquired the fish, which is probably a bad metaphor, because I guess I just made myself look like a shark. <laughs> Don't go too deep into that. All right, so as we mentioned, there's a lot of different reasons about why sell, why buy. Let's start on the left-hand side. We'll look at, well, why do people sell? Sometimes somebody wants to retire. They've been doing it for a long time. Or they just want to move on. I call that the next chapter of their life. I wrote up there, deleverage. Well, that means they want to de-risk their life. When you start a company, it is so much risk. And now that they've built something of substantial value, they want to take some of that equity and move it from the company into the bank account. So they can know no matter what happens tomorrow, if we have another Hurricane Harvey, at least what they can do is still have some money in the bank account. We call that chips off the table. Industry kind of a term. Sometimes you want to expand. You want the money for expansion capital. So what you'll do is you'll sell a portion, maybe a minority, maybe a majority, so it could be 10%, 40%, 60%, 80%, whatever it is. And you'll be selling that to 
a, an investor. And that investor takes a piece of equity, they'll give you some cash for that equity, and then they'll inject a whole bunch of capital into the balance sheet so that they could therefore grow the company. So you're not selling the whole thing, but selling a portion. And that's that cash infusion. So there's an old saying, would you rather own the entire grape or a solid portion of a watermelon? And that's the concept behind that cash infusion and selling some equity. All right, so the other side, well, why do people buy? How many people here work for a real large company? So about 70%, I would guess. Once you reach a certain size, it is very difficult to grow organically. So what do we mean by organic growth? You haven't heard the term before. It's, uh, let's just say, year-on-year -year sales growth. The company gets bigger by selling. So once you reach a certain level of market share, taking that marginal percentage is very difficult, very expensive. So an easier way to do it, I would argue an efficient way to do it, is in organic growth, which would mean an acquisition. So you're buying for many reasons. You could be buying for, I wrote there, IP goodwill. It could be for technology. It could be the brand name. It could be the geographic footprint. So let's say we're here in Texas, and we want to be in the West Coast. It's a lot easier to go buy a company in Los Angeles and then set up a whole new entity and take years until you can reach market penetration. Let's see, what else? Ah, okay, two terms up there. Roll up or add on. Who's heard of that before, roll up or add on? And yeah, I see a couple heads nodding, that's good. It's a pretty esoteric term, unless you're a kind of in the world. It's really referring to private equity. Does anybody know what private equity is? Just give me a nod or a shake, whatever it might be. That's not nods. Okay. So what the private equity does with their fund is they're looking to buy, most often, not every time, most often, a number of small firms, they roll them up, and then they sell them for a premium. If you have a $5 million firm, oh, sorry, if you have a $5 million revenue manufacturer, my guess is it's probably worth two and a half million. But if you have a $50 million manufacturer, it's probably worth $60 million. Those are my guesses, just knowing the market. In other words, the bigger the company, the better the premium. So what private equity does is they buy a number of companies within a space. Let's say I have a microphone. So they might buy a microphone manufacturer in Los Angeles, a microphone manufacturer in Toledo, Ohio, and another one in Kentucky. Each one is worth $20 million. You put it together, you have a $60 million company. They'll probably sell for $80 million. Big, just, just market guessing. So that's where they make the profit, by rolling it all together. And I work financial engineering. And so that means they're going to take a whole bunch of money, put on the balance sheet, it goes hand in hand with management engineering, and they're going to put their expertise and their capital, it's good work, this is the PE company, and they'll grow the company through organic and inorganic growth, and they'll accelerate it so the company's worth even more for a greater profit. All right, that was a lot of talking. You all still with me now? Okay, good. Now we'll go to some more of the fun stuff. All right, so these are the big, ugly red arrows. We all know red means bad, right? So why do sometimes M&A fail? We'll start on the left-hand side. Retention. You can see it all the way in the back. It says retention vertically on the is key employees. And every firm, no matter what the size is, there are key employees. They could be people of great influence, people of great skill. It could be your best salespeople. It could be the best managers. Those people must stay if you want to have great success. What is a company? It's a collection of people. And if you don't have good people or the right people, the company won't survive no matter how good the product. How many times have we seen companies who are first to entry in a market with a great idea but they failed? Maybe it's because they have the wrong people. Maybe it's because of a whole host of different ideas. Uh, number two, expectations. Has anybody ever heard of a company being acquired? And they said, <laughs> all right, next year, we're going to double sales. I mean, who comes up with that crap, right? It's a hockey stick projection. OK, we're, we're going to go like this. It never happens, right? Let's all be realistic. So if you have these unrealistic expectations, it's not going to work out. Unified goal. This goes into the corporate strategy world. If you have a strategy, you have to make it clear, concise, understandable, and, and have people internalize it inside of it. 
and you have to communicate and communicate and communicate. It's the old joke. Once you, once you communicate that strategy a million times, you're so sick of it, you say, congratulations, you reached 5% of the people. And I'd say that is 150% true in politics too. <laughs> so what happens if your goal isn't unified? Well, then there's a vacuum. Let's say you don't communicate enough. There's a power vacuum. Right? That means individuals and teams and departments, they all have different goals. And if you have different goals, what happens? You all move in different directions, don't you? It doesn't work out. If you move in different directions, that means you move nowhere. Execution, same thing, right? Same conversation. And then cultural clash. We'll, we'll talk more about that coming up. But we all know, just a quick example. Remember in the 80s, there were all these movies about a Japanese company buying an American company and the cultural clash that resulted. It's always some kind of drama comedy. But there is, there is some kind of truth in that basis. It's a different way of, of operating, a different way of procedures, and it's true. Even two firms in Houston, we'll go into more of that in detail. Uh, and then, no accountability for unhelpful behavior. Who's had a coworker who always talks too much? <laughs> Probably everybody, right? And who's had a coworker who talks too much with the wrong stuff? They're always giving out wrong information. Are they just deceitful? Are they just not smart? Or, I mean, who knows? But if you, I'm trying to be polite, right? <laughs> but if you have someone who's poisoning the web, that's the easy way to put it, right? We've all seen it. If they're not being held accountable, if they're not being called out, it's going to be a cancer, it's going to spread. And the biggest problem is going to be fear with an m and transaction. All right. More red arrows. All right, this is the last one of red arrows. Now we'll go to the, the smiling green arrows. So let's, let's dial this into more specifics into HR. The failures in each, any, I can't say that. The failures in M&A from HR. I've been involved in a lot of transactions. I sat at the table with the buyers and the sellers, and I can't remember the last time I seen someone from the HR department at the table during discussions, either pre-LOI or in due diligence period. And if it's in during due diligence period, I can't remember the last time we really focused hard on that conversation. So that's the first little arrow there. Attention. Uh, actually, let me skip that one. Let's go to focus on finance. In, in M&A, the conversation for 99.9% .9 of the time is about quantitative metrics. It's about finance. It's about the CPAs. It's almost that. Even when you're talking to something that could be a little bit more qualitative, like sales and marketing, it's still about customer concentrations, uh, dollars, median dollars spent per client on advertising, right? And it always goes back to that quantitative. But in, and I would argue, and maybe you feel differently, but I would argue in HR, it's more qualitative. There isn't that benchmark that you could use. For example, when I say benchmark, if you have an automobile parts manufacturer, there's going to be a ratio of assets to capital that's generally accepted. And they'll, they'll work off of these benchmarks. But I argue in HR that they don't have the same quantitative benchmarks. Am I right or wrong? Just give me a nod. Yeah, kind of. I can put that. Okay. Okay, retention, key employees, ongoing concern. Uh, I think a lot of people have seen a big checklist, and there's, you gotta get this done, this done, this done. And sometimes the people issues work, gotta get this done. But it's, it's an ongoing concern. Once you move Bob from Dallas to, to Cleveland, uh, it's just not a done deal. There's still a lot more work that needs to be done. And sometimes it's not recognized. You ready for the green arrows? Okay, good, we'll, we'll brighten it up a little bit. Hey, look at those. Okay, so what are successes with m and Well, the same topics, but this time they did it correctly. You retain the key people. You had a really good study period. Uh, the unified goal, the strategy was clearly made, articulated, implemented, and executed. And then here's the last one. Excellent and consistent communication. It's not just write a memo. They don't write emails anymore, do they? It's, it's not writing an email. 
No, face to face. Honest, detailed, comprehensive information. Okay, so that's part one, the overview. Before we go to integration, any questions so far? Do we have the time? Anybody? Maybe a, even a softball? Okay. <laughs> Uh, yeah. You skipped it. Yeah, I skipped it, but no, I guess there's not much more to say except for it kind of goes it goes to the HR not represented, right? But it, it's it's because people are so much focused so myopically on quantitative issues that they just the the qualitative people issues just don't get a I mean that's really it. But thank you for. Thank you for the one question. <laughs> I'll tell my wife, I've got one question. <laughs> okay, uh, integration. This one, this was straight out like a business school chart, right? It doesn't really tell you much. So what we're looking at are the phases of implementation, and it starts with an LOI. Who knows what an LOI is? Yeah, okay, yes, yeah, scream it out, scream it out. Letter of intent, that's right. And so if you're not familiar, the letter of intent concept is the buyer writes a letter to the seller. A lot of pomp and circumstance. And it says, we plan to buy you at and around this date at this valuation calculation, and we'll be buying X, Y, and Z assets, uh, more or less. That's the, that's the general gist of it. Two, three, four pages long at the most, unless it's a massive deal. And then, uh, and then the buyer acknowledges and signs it, agrees to it, and then the due diligence period begins. And due diligence, that is a fancy time that the buyers are verifying that everything that the sellers represented, everything they said is true, and they didn't leave anything else out. So it's, you're, you're basically, you're searching for errors and omissions. But what we're really looking at here is in an ideal situation, the HR department, they can be involved before the LOI is written. Meaning before an offer to purchase or an offer to merge you know, with another firm. Let the voice be heard. Let those possible issues be recognized up front. The possible expensive issues. So you can work any kind of issues um, into the price or into the valuation formula. Now once the LOI is accepted, the integration planning starts to begin, and then we go to the process of discovery, and, and of course, the best companies, during due diligence, they plan the integration process during this time, so once you have the close, you can sprint, and you're off to the races in these phases here of organize, mobilize, implement, and perform, right? And that can be in a textbook, right? <laughs> yeah, it doesn't take much. See, that's the beauty of coming today and not just reading the slides. Yeah, okay, a little plug, right? Okay. Remember we talked about people talk, they gossip, they share information they shouldn't. Sometimes they don't know the information or they hear half of it and it's out of context. Other times people make it up. That's a negative influence and that negative influence needs to be countered to keep up morale and also to prevent the exodus of talent, right? Retain your key people. Don't let those people who can leave easily, don't let them leave. Just because they walk out the door on Friday does not mean they will return on Monday. You ever hear the phrase, fight the enemy from within? I don't know who originated it, but I think it's pretty, I think it makes sense in this context that you need to keep up that face-to-face -face communication, to keep that trust before the trust is eroded. Understand that people are fearful about everything. Job roles, functions, they all change. The, I mean, if you have a, a feeling of insecurity, then there's not happiness. Fearful is never equal happiness, and that's negative. Uh, next one here, the culture clash. So we talked a bit, I mentioned the, the movies with the Japanese companies coming in America in the 80s. So, okay, here, here's a simple one. And this, this is a true story. Uh, there's a company here in Houston, and they bought another company here in Houston. And the buyer, they're very much um, 
dot the I, cross the T type of company. And very, very strict. Follow these processes, procedures. But most importantly, they were, you must be in the office at 8 a.m. Not 8 01, not 8 02, 8 a.m. That's it. Well, the company they bought was a little more, you know, go with the flow. We don't care what time you get in, you just gotta get your stuff done. Some of the people who worked there had a long commute. It was not, not a big surprise. And a lot of them, I mean, if you have a young family, like I do, you know, your kids go off to the bus stop, they don't the bus and come at 7.30. You're not making it there by eight. And so some of their key people left. They left within a month. They said, I can't be here. And if I get here at 8.15, you can't sit here and scream at me. You know, they're like, I'm 50 years old. Don't scream at me for being 15 minutes late. But that's what the new buyers did. And the, and the, the new buyers are like, why isn't this working? Why isn't this working? I said, because you're a bunch of micromanagers, and these guys are the opposite. It's a culture clash. Uh, just little things. like. Uh, Anybody work for an insurance company? Is it, is it very, very quiet in your office? Yes. Uh, I don't know why that is, but it seems to be true across insurance companies, right? Now, I was at AIG once, and you could hear, uh, I felt bad for hear my feet walking on the carpet. It was so quiet. <laughs> but I mean, that's, it's okay for some people, but it, sometimes it doesn't work well with the company. That's a, that is a clash of culture. Uh, what about the open door versus closed door? Clash of culture. Little things. How many companies go out for drinks afterwards? And then how many other companies say, oh, no, 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 we don't socialize. We would never drink with our, our colleagues. Culture clash. Out with the old, then with the new, right? Who is the changer? Or who are the changees? We'll find out. What's the, uh, I remember doing this in like health class in high school, those stages of grief. Was it anger, denial, whatever? Okay, well, here we are. Stages of resistance. Betrayal, denial, identifying crisis, search for solutions. Just food for thought. I mean, not much to say to it, but I thought, I thought this was really interesting, so I wanted to share it. That was it. Is it true? What do you think? Yes. 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 All right, good. If it wasn't true, would you say so? No. Maybe, maybe. <laughs> Okay, right, we're going to do the, the prime steps for HR during the integration process. We talk about talent, process retention, compensation, benefits. That all makes sense. We all know that, right? Design new performance reward systems. Okay. I want to skip ahead right here, something interesting. Educate what to do, what to expect. Here we are. That's the one that's interesting. How many people have been in a merger or acquisition and they had a single senior executive, doesn't mean the CEO, but somebody up there in the food chain, whose job it was to champion and to push through the integration? Have you seen that? Yeah? A couple people? Have, have you been someplace where it hasn't happened? You seen that too? I bet it makes a big difference. So that leader, they need to be sensitive to all the, the cultural differences. Uh, they need to be flexible with the outside methodologies, processes. They need to be committed to employee retention. They need to have a vision. They need to sell it and make that vision clear and articulate. And I'd also very much stress that person, their full focus must be on this integration. They cannot be responsible for the ongoing daily business processes. <coughs> They need to be fully focused on this. Where are the people who are not in? Has that, has that been the case in the past? Yeah, sometimes? Anybody say no? I've seen it, yeah, I've seen it uh, go up in flames before. All right, now we'll go to part three, role of HR. Before I move on to this next exotic topic, is there any questions on part two? Yes, or first one on part, please. You were saying about HR having a role at the LOI stage. Mm -hmm. I've found that that's personally really difficult. Oh, absolutely. Well, because, <laughs> not, well, from the standpoint that the, as the buyer, they don't always want us in there yet. And then a lot of times the seller doesn't want to disclose anything. It's like pulling teeth a lot of times, even up until the last moment to get any sort of data prior to close. I, I totally get that. Um, 
that's, that's one of those funny things we wrestle with, because we represent the sellers 99 times of 100. And about what data will we disclose and not disclose, things like uh, the customer list. So I put things in code, because we need to know the customer concentration and what their, or in other words, your top five biggest customers, what percentage of sales is that? But they won't give the names. I get that. So we call it customer A, customer B, we code coded. And so I try to make a compromise to what you refer to is I would say, let's just say bullet point, what are the top three concerns HR must know about before the integration or what it might be? I would say number one, the benefits packages. How much is the company paying? What are people combining? Uh, do they have a, I mean, what do we have versus they have? Does one firm have the Cadillac package? The other firm has the opposite? What is there a term for that? The non-Cadillac package? <laughs> so, Six Pinto. Yeah, but who, 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 who gets raised up? Who gets lowered down? Are they going to compromise? And that's a huge cost driver. Uh, the second part is what's the percentage of salary to the overall expenditures? I mean, those are the type of issues you're looking for, right? Is that it? Right. I mean, you're looking at that, you're looking at pay grades, because a lot of times, even though you're in the same industry and you're looking at similar titles, similar assets, similar functions, your pay grade is totally opposite or your pay style. So you may have somebody who technically has a lower base pay grade, but they have different pay elements. Mm -hmm. And if you don't know all that until you get to close, then it's, it's really jarring for the backside of HR to be confronted with, oh, yeah, you know, you're used to doing it this way, and then here's the complete flip side that you've got to figure out how to get done. Kind of under this. And yeah. yeah, you're absolutely right. And it's, you're, like you said, you're pulling teeth, you get some, could be basic information. They don't want to give up any kind of details. And, but I, I guess try, I would try to work around it in circles the best way you could. You know, give a range, tell us what your starting entry, you know, entry, uh, entry level might be. Well, when you post a job, what do you, how much should I post the, the salary for. I mean, because I've done that, I searched LinkedIn for companies or Indeed to see what they're trying to answer these questions. Right. But you're absolutely right. It's up to the seller to disclose things. So I wish there was a better magic bullet, but there, there isn't. Was there another question in the back I saw? Oh, yes, yes, ma'am. Yes, absolutely. Uh, this one here? I would, I would imagine, and I, I don't know any statistical data to back this up, I would imagine it's somebody who's just below the CEO, who has the, who has the power to exact uh, change across multiple segments of the business. And who has the trust of the employees in the company that's being yeah. acquired? I mean, there's, there's things. There's, there's authority and there's responsibility, and they better match. So if they have a response to do with that authority, good luck to that person. Uh, any other ones? Last one? Yes, yes, ma'am. You said there are three top concerns for HR. Then the package and percentage of sales Well, I'm just making that up top of my head. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you for listening. I'll, I'll, I'll think about it. I'm recording it, so maybe, uh, maybe we just go back and figure it out. Okay. All right, thank you for those. And we'll, we'll have time for questions at the end. All right, so part three, the role of HR. These are, these are the bullet points, right? This is the overview right here. The trusted advisor, the expert, give input, manage the information, communicate, right? Very important. So we'll go into more detail. Uh, this is a very colorful slide. What I did is I, I kind of put the colors together that go together, right? So the two reds on top. When I say soft, due diligence. I'm referring to benefits. Uh, I'm referring to creating a human capital audit. And then from there, HR can select or they can create different management teams for the post-close new entity. And on the next slide, we'll go into more about that, that due diligence checklist. And then the next, I think that's a bluish color there, the integration process we just talked about. Um, and then I, but the real thing is here is oversee the internal communications. That's, that's the real prime area there. Uh, number three, not the third one, but uh, the green. Let's go that. That's green, right? 
In order to understand the cultural differences, I would argue you have to define each company's culture. And then you can figure out the differences. Uh, what are the soft expectations? Uh, how do employee and employer, how do they, how do they get together? Where's, and how does it differ between each company? Uh, in orange, employee concerns, layoffs, relocations, uncertainty, rumors. We'll go into more about that, but I guess changing roles and structures. Uh, who will occupy which job? What will the teams look like? My current boss is this person. Tomorrow, who will my next, my new boss be? And what's a stat? I'm sure you all know this better than I. Don't 90% of people leave their job because they're direct boss? Is that what it is? And if you have a great boss now, I mean, who's going to be tomorrow? That's a lot of concern. Um, oh, and then this one I like a lot. How is success defined and measured? And then for teams, for individuals, for departments, is it a radical departure or is it the same? Or is it easier? You will be given an easier role. And I always like flow charts. So if you're able to make a flow chart, that's my suggestion. Who knows the Society for Human Resource Management? Are they popular among y'all? Yeah. <laughs> is that a big one? Yeah. yeah. They had, when I was researching this for the, the presentation, I was looking for a real good due diligence checklist with HR of mine. And this checklist is like 13 pages. I was about to hit print, and I realized that's a lot of paper. So what I did is I took the highlights, you know, the big bullet points here, and put it here. So if you want a really big, deep uh, checklist, it's the, again, the Society for Human Resource Management. <laughs> if, you, if you can't find it, send me an email. I'll, I'll send you an email. <laughs> <laughs> but you all know it, don't you? Yeah. All right. HR needs to I'm just teasing. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't. <laughs> it's kind of like asking a football player, do you guys know ESPN? Do you guys know ESPN? <laughs> So, okay, so the big list, it goes deeper and deeper. So that's funny, I present your own stuff to your own, yeah. <laughs> Next week I'll go to API and I'll say, hey guys, this is what oil is. Yeah. Yeah. At, least you're, at least you're credible, okay. Yeah. At least I don't lie about it. <laughs> All right, questions on this quick, quick uh, topic? Okay, good stuff. All right, this was the best practices. There's lots of detail on here, so again, I'm glad you all have the printout. And we'll, just, we'll kind of highlight a couple of them. But it's, this is slide one of three slides. And there are so many of them, I just put it in these simple bullet points. Because they're pretty self-explanatory. So communicate. That's kind of the theme of the day, isn't it? Plan integration, choose the people. Uh, I like this.